If you would, those who have your Bibles, turn with me in your Bibles uh, to 1 Samuel, the Old Testament uh, book of 1 Samuel. And I want to place emphasis on uh, chapter 1. I want to begin reading uh, at chapter 1, verse 4. Verse 4, uh, those of you who have uh, your, uh, again, your uh, Bibles, I'm asking that you would share with us with this portion of Scripture. All right. Uh, it reads thusly, on the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Panina, his wife, and to all her sons, and daughters. Verse 5, but to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her though the Lord had closed her womb. Verse 7, so it went on year by year as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, uh, Panina used to provoke Hannah. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. Verse 8, And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep, and why do you not eat? And why is your heart so sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Verse 9, After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. Hannah was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Verse 11, and she vowed a vow saying, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all of the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Verse 12, as Hannah continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Uh, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman. Verse 14, And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety uh, and vexation. Verse 17, uh, then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. I'm going to stop right there at verse 18. Our emphasis goes down to verse 20, but I'm going to stop right there at verse 18. Uh, God's word is forever blessed. Uh, this morning, brothers and sisters, I want to use as a subject, a very interesting subject, I want to use uh, this as a subject, Hannah's wrestling match. Hannah's wrestling match. God help you servant as we preach today your word. Continue to 
make me transparent so people hear your voice speaking to them this day. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> One of my favorite passages in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 32. <clears throat> in that portion of scripture, the biblical character Jacob was suddenly confronted by an unknown adversary with whom he had to wrestle throughout the night. Though Jacob did his very best to put up a good fight, he found that he was both unmatched, or I should say outmatched and outmaneuvered by his supposed enemy. When the attacker saw that he was not getting the best, or I should say prevailing against Jacob, he reached down and touched Jacob's hip, thereby supernaturally throwing it out of joint. I'm sure Jacob was in enormous pain. However, he quickly rationalized and realized that whoever this was that he was wrestling with must have been some sort of divine deity because of his unnatural superhuman ability to just brush up against a person's hip and immediately render it dislocated from the joint. At this point in the narrative, something unexpected took place. Instead of Jacob continuing to fight his attacker in the way he had been doing, he switched up his strategy and began not to fight him, but to cling on to him for dear life. The adversary <clears throat> directed Jacob to let him go because daybreak was upon them. Now, as I read this portion of scripture, I understand that this attacker was telling Jacob, uh, really, stop fighting because the contest is over. Because there's no way that Jacob could win with a dislocated hip. However, Jacob replied to the man. Uh, he replied as an individual that was wounded yet. Jacob recognized, if I can just hang on to him, my entire life will change for the better. That's when he told the adversary, he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I won't let you go unless you bless me. I can imagine that Jacob didn't just say it one time. In my heart, I hear him saying it numerous times. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I won't let you loose until and unless you bless me. The attacker heard Jacob and then asked him, what is your name? Jacob answered, by saying and calling his name. He said, my name is Jacob. The adversary then announced, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, because you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Well, brothers and sisters, I've presented this pericope, this portion of scripture in Genesis as an introduction to this sermon to emphasize the fact that there's a point in the life of every person where we recognize that we are not wrestling flesh and blood alone. However, we really strive in this life against humankind and we strive against the Almighty at points in our lives as well. Tell me, you might ask, how does a person wrestle with God 
and still win? Boy, what a question. If we're smart, we will come to the point where our wrestling turns into clinging and we hold fast for a blessing from the very one that has been our supposed foe. In Genesis, Jacob told his attacker, he said, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. Well, the attacker did bless him and changed his name to Israel, which means he strives with God. Indeed, Jacob had done just that. He had been striving with God. He wrestled with the very one that was able to bless him. Well, here today in our text for the morning, Hannah has to indeed wrestle with the very one that's able to bless her. She finds herself this morning in a precarious predicament, predicament that's not of her own doing. You see, Hannah has a difficulty. She has a problem. She has an issue. Hannah is barren. She is, by all accounts, infertile, which means she has not been able to bear a child. Modern science has clearly informed us many times that a woman's supposed status of infertility is not always her fault, but that the inability, I hear some, I hear some woman saying yes and shaking your head, I see you, listen, but the inability to conceive could be credited to the male and his possible low sperm count. However, the fact that Hannah is one of two women that are married to the same man, Elkanah, and the fact that the other wife has successfully produced children tells us convincingly that Hannah is with out doubt barren. Hannah is infertile. Hannah is labeled as unfruitful. In a day uh, that uh, where this horrific stigma was equated, equated with being cursed by God. In the Bible, there were five women that were said to be barren. They were Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Hannah, and there was the mother of Samson. Five women that were said <clears throat> to have been barren. There were some other women who uh, were supposedly not able to bear because of their age, but they were not listed as barren. These five were listed as barren. And the Bible lets us know that they were considered as barren. They were named as barren. They were labeled as barren before uh, the Bible uncovered any other details about their lives. The title barren was a death warrant for women in Hannah's day. The Bible records that Sarah despised being barren so much until she sank morally to the point that she offered up her handmaid to Abraham so that the stigma of infertility could be removed from her. God help me to preach today. Rachel went so far as to equate childbearing with life itself. She equated having children with living. How do I know this? Well, I, I know she equated childbirth and childbearing with, with life itself because she cried out one day to Jacob, give me children 
or I shall die. She spoke to Jacob as if he was the cause that she was barren. Moreover, when uh, Rachel did conceive uh, and she brought Joseph on the scene, she declared to everybody that would listen. She said, listen, God has taken away my reproach. That's what infertility and barrenness seemed to be a reproach. And it seemed to always come from the living God. In Hannah's day, the issue of barrenness had everything to do with purpose and worth. I don't think the people listening to me, I don't think you might understand just how important it was to be able to bear children if you were a female. If you were a woman, it was your purpose to bear children. Listen, that, that, that resoundingly sent off a notice of your worth. If a woman could not conceive, she was considered unable to fulfill the primary role of women on the face of the earth. I hear somebody shaking their head, but this is the way that it was in Hannah's day. And so when Hannah was considered uh, as being barren, she was viewed as worthless in a world where women were valued only if they could cook, clean, have intercourse, and bear children. Well, it's clear that Hannah was seen as barren, but it is important, however, for us to ask, why is she barren? Well, 1 Samuel, uh, that is 1 Samuel chapter 1, Verses 5, 4 through 6, I should say, uh, tells us why Haran, Hannah was barren. Uh, listen to what it says. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Panina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Verse 6, and a rival, her rival used to provoke her grievously, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. Did you see it? Did you see it there in the text? Notice that in verses 5 and 6, we find that God himself had kept Hannah from having children. It wasn't that Hannah's body was unable to conceive. It was because God was standing in the way of her becoming a mother. It's almost as if God had another plan for Hannah. Therefore, Hannah had no other recourse but to wrestle with God over the issue of her barrenness. Brothers and sisters, let me quickly interject parenthetically here that there's somebody that's listening to me and you're saying to me, Pastor, I've not been able to have children. I've never been able to have a child. Why is that happening? Why is God doing that to me? Does God have some curse on me? No. Brothers and sisters, let me suggest that God has another plan for your life. Listen, many times in church, we, we, we uh, lift up and celebrate adoption, but we don't celebrate the kinds of human, uh, 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 human progress uh, progresses that allow us uh, to uh, deal with infertility, with the drugs and uh, the, the various means that we now have available to us to help. But listen, uh, however life comes about, it always comes from God's 
hand. And so, if God gives life in a different way, then blessed be the name of the Lord. If God allows you to remain barren, then blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh, but blessed be the name of the Lord because I declare to you, God has another plan. God is not mean. He is not a mean God. No. You have to understand that God has another plan for your life. Well, Hannah had to wrestle over the issue, all right? She had to wrestle over the issue of her barrenness. And like Jacob that I talked about earlier, Hannah was forced to wrestle not only with God, but she was forced, all right, uh, to wrestle with humankind as well. I mentioned earlier that Hannah was married to a man who had two wives, of which Hannah was one. The other wife, yeah, the, the, the other wife was a woman named P Panina. Verse 7 is clear when it tells us that Hannah was provoked and tortured by Elkanah's, Elkanah's other wife, Panina, who became what the Bible calls Hannah's earthly rival. Panina should have been Hannah's best friend. But instead, she became Hannah's rival. She became a thorn in the rear of Hannah's anatomy. <laughs> I wondered why Panina had such enmity against Hannah until I understood that Hannah was Elkanah's, probably Elkanah's, first wife. But due to her infertility, Elkanah eventually married Penina because she was able to have children and continue the family line. Penina was the kind of woman that wouldn't allow Hannah to forget that she was able to bear children and that Hannah could not. I can imagine Penina said uh, to Hannah, Hannah, uh, I, I, I know uh, you might want to help me with my children seeing that you don't have any children of your own. And then she would smile slyly. Well, the truth is that Panina saw Hannah as a threat to her relationship with Elkanah. Therefore, I imagine that uh Panina would tease and taunt Hannah to the point that Hannah wanted to physically respond to her provocation. Obviously, Panina tormented, tortured, taunted Hannah on a regular basis until Hannah had to learn, listen, how to discount Panina's insult. However, she would, Panina would especially aggravate and irritate Hannah at certain points throughout every year. 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 21 informs us that at, uh, during the year and during the feast each year, Elkanah would travel from Ramah where he and his family lived, and they would travel uh, about 15 miles to Shiloh. I want you to see this map that I have. 15 miles to Shiloh, where the tabernacle was located. This was a rough area. It was a rough trip, 15 miles, that they would travel from Ramah, Ramah up to Shiloh. You can see it there in orange. Well, 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 21 says this, and it's on there. The man Elkanah and all his wife, all his house that is, went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. 
Well, Elkanah went to Shiloh to present his sacrifice in, at, uh, at the tabernacle. However, after the sacrifice was offered, food normally would be distributed to all those uh, that were present for the feast. Panina and her children received nominal portions of the food that was left over from the sacrifice. I believe and I'm sure that Panina had a group of uh, children uh, that were uh, that really ate up all the food and the crumbs and didn't leave anything left. However, Elkanah made sure that Hannah had received an extra portion because he loved her, even though the Lord had prevented her from bearing children. Well, brothers and sisters, I see three quick things in the text that I want to offer up to you, and then I'll close. Notice, first of all, I want to show you that Hannah, uh, in dealing with her problem, her issue. Hannah cried to God, not to others. Hannah cried out to God, not to others. Each year, Hannah would go with Elkanah and the rest of the family, Penina, her children, all of them, uh, all, all, all them, all right, to the feast in Shiloh. Uh, the text tells us that each year, uh, Panina would cause Hannah trouble. Panina and uh, her, her baby's kids would cause uh, Hannah trouble. First Samuel uh, chapter one verse seven tells us. So it went on year by year, as often as Hannah went up to the house of the Lord or that is, Panina went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke Hannah. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Notice that whenever Hannah would go up to the feast in Shiloh, Panina would tease and taunt Hannah even more concerning her barrenness. She would do all she could to cause Hannah to feel beneath her and less than the other women that were in attendance at the feast. I'm sure the devil in Panina would do this at the time that they went to the tabernacle. Well, you might ask me why. Well, I, I found out that uh, whenever we go uh, to worship at the tabernacle, there's transformation power at the house of God. <laughs> I wish somebody would hear me. There's transformation power at the house of God in the congregation of the saints. Brothers and sisters, I'm not talking about a physical house. I'm talking about wherever the people of God gather, wherever the worship comes about, there's always, always transformation power at the house of God in the congregation of the saints. Well, on this particular occasion, after the family had eaten their meal, I can see Hannah deciding to get up. Uh, the Bible says that Hannah rose. Hannah got up and went to the sanctuary. Uh, verses 9 and 10 say this. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed, Hannah was, and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Notice here that in Hannah's distress, she cried out to God in her prayer. She cried out to God through prayer. Hannah's relationship with God allowed her to pray to God in such a way that she could empty her heart of all of her concerns. Hannah was, in fact, tied up and tangled up with God. She was tangled up with him. She knew God to be faithful. 
And because of all of that she knew about God, she, she knew that she could trust him with all of her cares and her concerns. Moreover, I believe that Hannah knew that God was powerful enough to make fertile that which was originally barren. God could change Hannah's situation even when he was the one that caused it in the first place. Did you hear what I said? God was able to change Hannah's circumstance, even when he was the one that caused it in the first place. Hannah knew that God was able to bring into being that which was previously uncreated. He could open a womb that was previously closed. Hannah knew that the term barren only meant that that woman had not had a child up until that point. Her intense awareness of God was of such that she cried out to him, knowing that God was sovereign, knowing that God was sure. No, Hannah didn't play games with God. She didn't go to him in pretense. She was completely real and she was sincere with him and told him all that was in her heart, even in her distress, despair, and in her despondency. Yes, she was despondent over her ability to bear a child, so she cried out to God in her anguish and her despair. She cried out to God in her grief. She cried out to God in her seeming hopelessness. Uh, she cried out to God because there was nobody else that she really could cry to that could make a difference. Brothers and sisters, I want to ask you, when's the last time you cried out to God? When's the last time you were real and open with God? When was the last time you went to him about your condition that seemed to be incurable and unchangeable? When was the last time you shared your angst and your anxiety with God over a situation that seemed to be hopeless? Well, I found I found in my life, let me tell you, I found that God is big enough to hear all of our anxieties and our frustrations with life. And though God could be credited as being the author of the unwanted circumstances that we face, he is still able <laughs> to walk us through the fire that we find ourselves in. And he's able to speak a word of peace and comfort to our spirits. No, I, I, I see that, that Hannah did not talk to her husband, Elkanah, and she would not share any of what she was going through with Penina. No, she wouldn't do that. But let me tell you, Penina was Hannah's rival, but Penina was not her problem. Hannah's problem was that she wanted to bear children to carry on her family line in a world that disregarded barren women and called her worthless if she remained infertile. Therefore, Hannah went to God. She cried out to God to deal with her barrenness and her infertility. She knew the only way she could experience transformation was through her relationship with God. God was and is life. God was her life. And God was able to transform her barren situation into a celebration of life. He was and he is even now able to transform her pain into her purpose that would bring life to her world whenever God said so. Well, God was able to do that for Hannah. And I want, to, want somebody to, that's listening to the sound and under the sound of my voice to know he's able to do that right now for you if you ask him. God is able to transform your empty places 
into spaces that are filled with his transforming presence. He's able to bring a, a peaceful night of rest to your, to your life, to your nights that are filled with stress and straining. He's able, God is, he's able to turn it all around if you have the courage to ask him and the faith to believe in him. The songwriter was right. We heard the song today and it's true. There is no secret. <laughs> what God can do, what he's done for others. <laughs> I wish you'd hear me today. What he has done for other people, you aren't the only one. What he's done for others, he can do for you. Hannah cried out to God and somebody listening to my voice, you need to cry out to God right now. However, I see in the text that not only did Hannah cry out to God, but Hannah concentrated on God and not her rival. Yeah, Hannah concentrated on God and not her rival. Hannah endured constant taunts from Penina, and I'm sure uh, those taunts and that teasing brought bitterness to the soul of Hannah. I'm sure of it. However, I never read once that Hannah retaliated against Penina for her constant provocation. I never see that in the text. The name Hannah means woman of grace, and Hannah exhibited grace when she had these conversations with Panina, especially when Panina was trying to tease Hannah about her supposed barrenness. The text tells me that Panina plotted to provoke Hannah when they would travel to the tabernacle at Shiloh. In fact, even when Hannah had had more than enough of Panina's taunts and she began to weep bitterly, she poured her heart out to God in verse 10. But listen, I never see in the text where Hannah mentioned Panina and her taunts in her prayer to God. Listen, Hannah was obviously a threat to Panina, but to Panina was never a threat to Hannah. I wish somebody would hear me. How do I know that? Well, Hannah never mentioned Panina in prayer, but she kept her focus on God and her major issue. Listen, brothers and sisters, you may have a rival, but rivals come and go. God remains. He's the one with whom we have to do. Hannah's issue was with God and not with her rival. Panina did not cause. She wasn't the one that caused Hannah to be barren in the first place. And Panina could not heal Hannah of her barrenness. So why would Hannah waste time talking to God about Panina? God allowed Hannah's condition, and God was the only one that could change the circumstances of her condition. Therefore, Hannah never mentioned Panina in her prayer to God, because when it really came down to it, Hannah and her haters did not matter anyhow. Listen, brothers and sisters, I'm talking to somebody. I want you to hear, I'm talking to somebody who's wrestling with God and with man. I want to tell you today that your haters don't matter anyhow. <laughs> your haters do not matter. Only thing you should be concerned about is not your haters because they can't help you. And what I found is when you have God on your side, they can't hurt you. <laughs> Well, not only do I see in the text that Hannah concentrated on God and uh, that Hannah cried out to God, I also see in the text that Hannah, lastly, covenanted with God. Covenanted with God. She covenanted with God. What are you talking about? Well, 
Hannah knew that, that this moment was her opportunity to have an audience with God. Therefore, she went to God while she was there in the tabernacle with her request. The 11th verse says this, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. Listen, I got a quote here uh, from this particular commentary. Hannah made a vow that if God would grant her request, she would give her son to the Lord for as long as he lived. This dedication of a son was a commitment to the Nazarite vow described in Numbers chapter 6 verses 1 through 8. It was the same vow undertaken by the parents of Samson, who they dedicated to the Lord under nearly identical circumstances. Listen, brothers and sisters, Hannah covenanted, uh, covenanted with God and vowed that if God would grant her request, she would give the child back to the Lord. That was a powerful vow. Because the Nazarite vow was normally made, listen, for a prescribed period of time. However, Hannah went further than the vow. She told the Lord, if you give me a son, I'll give it back to you for his entire life. She literally dedicated her son to the service of God. Well, God took her up on her offer. It was because, listen, she decided to make a vow to the Lord and God knew she was serious and sincere and that she would keep her vow to him. The Bible says it's better not to make a vow than to make one and to break it. But Hannah was serious about her vow to the Lord. While she was there pouring her heart out to God, Eli, who was the priest, Eli, who was the head of the tabernacle, saw Hannah, her lips moving, but she wasn't saying anything. He thought she was drunk and charged Hannah with public drunkenness. But Hannah let him know that she had not been drinking. Listen to what verse 12 down to 17 says. I want to read the text because the text is clear. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drunk drink, but I have been pouring my, my soul out before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman for all along. I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. Listen, I believe that Hannah was talking, looking at Eli, but she was really communicating with God. How do I know it? If you read verse 18, what 18 says, and she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad. She said, let your servant. Well, I believe uh, she was talking to God and she was saying to him, I am your servant. Let me find favor in your eyes. But somehow I believe that Hannah knew 
that she had received what she had prayed for. <laughs> Listen, the Bible up until this time says that Hannah had continued fasting at the, at the feast, that she was fasting. However, now what we see in the text in verse 18 is that she went her way and she ate and her face was no longer sad. I can imagine that Hannah had a glad countenance about her. Somebody noticed, somebody said, what's wrong with Hannah? She's different today. Normally she's quiet and she's crying, tearful, weeping, but she's not weeping anymore. She's rejoicing. She's celebrating because it seems like something has happened to her. If you read verses 19 and 20, let me bring this to a close right now. They rose early in the morning, it says, the family did, and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. Listen, I, I, I believe Hannah wanted to tell the Lord, thank you. Instead of them getting on the road after the feast, they rose early in the morning. Uh, listen, Hannah rose, but this show enough is when she rose up because she rose to thank God for what he had done for her. She rose to give him praise for how he had blessed her. Verse 20 goes further and says, In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And Hannah called the child's name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Listen, brothers and sisters, Hannah asked for a, a blessing. And God blessed Hannah with what she asked for. I began, let me close this, I began this message telling you about Jacob and how he wrestled with an unknown man that was able to bless him. Well, I close this sermon today by telling you that Hannah wrestled with God. And she literally told God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I can imagine in her prayer, Hannah said, Lord, bless me. Lord, don't leave me. Lord, bless me. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. Bless me, oh Lord. Bless me. Well, in the text, in the text that I read at the beginning of this sermon in Genesis 32, the man that Jacob was wrestling with changed his name. He said, you're no longer named Jacob, but Israel. Listen, God here in 1 Samuel chapter 1, God changed Hannah's name. And even more, he changed her status. She no longer was known as barren. She was no longer known as infertile. But Hannah was now known as fruitful. She was now a channel of life that had come from the living God. Brothers and sisters, if God can do it for Hannah, he can surely do it for you. God can turn the situation around if you have the courage to ask him to and put your trust in him. If you do that, then God can move and you will be triumphant as you wrestle with humankind and with the living God.